to our first lecture on ancient Egypt. We're going to look in this section at the pre-dynastic, early dynastic era, and at art and architecture of the Old Kingdom. So a couple things to be aware of with the Egyptian artwork is to think about the fact that so much of it is dependent upon the Nile River itself, because of course the flooding of the Nile is what provides the silt that fertilizes and that allows for architecture, that allows for permanent settle, <coughs> settlements. So as people begin to settle in two regions, Upper and Lower Egypt, Upper Egypt is actually more southerly, more mountainous, and Lower Egypt is the region that includes the river Delta, the water from the river joins the sea. So you can see here in our map, Lower Egypt is the Delta region, Upper Egypt is this larger set in the south. You don't have to know all of the individual dates. <laughs> it's easy enough to remember that the Egyptian uh, historical era can be broken into three major phases, Old Kingdom, Middle Kingdom, and New Kingdom. The Old Kingdom era includes the uh, construction of the pyramids. New Kingdom includes the very famous King Tut. Uh, later in Egyptian history, it is eventually absorbed into what becomes Greece and also then what is the Roman Empire. You don't have to know all of the various gods, but it's important to remember that for the majority of Egyptian history, it is a polytheistic uh, religious culture. There are several gods that you'll see quite frequently um, in the art world is Horus, who is the son of Osiris. This is Horus here with his falcon guise for his head. We will quite frequently see Thoth. Thoth is associated with uh, writing and courtly deeds and record uh, records of history. Hathor, number five, is the goddess of love, birth, and death. You'll also see uh, Ra, who is the sun the sun god appears in multiple different forms, most frequently Amun-Ra. Eleven is Osiris. Osiris is the god of agriculture, and he also is the land of the dead. Very important. Equally important, I suppose, for our purposes, is number ten here, the god Anubis, who's the god of you will also fairly frequently run into depictions of Isis. She's number 12 on our list here. She's the wife of Osiris, mother of Horus. The reason that we are able to translate or understand um, much of Egyptian history is because of the discovery in 1799 of this remarkable object. This is the Rosetta Stone. The Rosetta Stone is essentially a record, historical record, of um, the absorption of, of Egypt into uh, Greco uh, power under the um, soldier Ptolemy. Ptolemy is under Alexander the Great. So Alexander the Great from Macedonia uh, gains control of Greece. One of his generals, Ptolemy, is installed as the new dynastic ruler of Egypt. And so this document that you see here includes in hieroglyphic script at the top, then in the middle section, the same text script known as Demotic, and at the lower section, the same script a third time, but this time in Greek. This allows us to backwards translate from the Greek, which was still known through the Demotic, to be able to understand what the hieroglyphics themselves actually stood for. So you can see a little section of each of those three copies of the same document here carved into the Rosetta Stone. So this was really a seminal moment in being able to translate um, all of the Egyptian uh, hieroglyphic language. Now, the hieroglyphics themselves are, for the most part, pictographs. Um, so they are not really meant to be representative of um, visual images as much as they are meant to represent sounds. So they essentially function as letters. So when you see these as uh, carvings on statuary, etc., it's not meant to be um, seen as pictographs. It's meant to be seen as actual text or writing. One of the letters that's always kind of intrigued me is the uh, shape for the sound of the 
Nile River, of course, is the source of much uh, agriculture and is the focus of people's lives in many ways. It makes sense that the water type image that looks like water in a line, like a river, would equate with the sound that begins the name of that river itself. We also make sure that we're aware of the fact that the Egyptian um, conventions of representation, the way that the culture chooses to represent objective reality, has remained essentially unchanged for close to 3,000 years. The uh, proportional rules that you see are mapped out in this grid, which is of the grid that you see from this section here. This is an unfinished carving. You can see sections have begun and sections are unfinished. And exactly where we got these precise uh, geometric rules of the proportions of the body. You'll notice that it's quite different from the proportions that we'll see in ancient the uh, classical Greek proportions would be seven head units tall. If you count your boxes here, one, two, three, four, you've got 19 units in height. The head doesn't quite fill those units. So the proportion of seven such units to equal the overall head height would not mathematically work out. In fact, this figure is out of proportion from the Greek system. Another aspect that you see that's really common to a lot of ancient art is this composite view. And we saw that a bit in Mesopotamia. You can see that the head is always turned in profile, which makes sense. It's easier to depict the nose from the side. Want the nose coming forward to face you, but the eyeball is really hard to draw in profile. And so you notice that the eye itself is actually forward-facing view. Same for the shoulders. It's kind of hard to show the detail of the torso if the body is in profile. So the head's in profile, the eyes facing forward, the torso is facing forward, but the legs, especially if they're moving, and feet especially, are hard to draw if the figure forward towards you. So again, the legs are turned into profile. That again is our composite view. We've seen a bit of that in the prehistoric cave. We certainly saw it in uh, ancient Mesopotamian art, and you'll see it throughout Egyptian art over the course of roughly 3,000 years. You'll also run into a handful of sort of symbolic garments that you'll see throughout the artwork of ancient Egypt, which includes a two-crown system. The crown of upper is shaped somewhat like a bowling pin. The uh, crown of Lower Egypt has this kind of curly hue device on the front, and when those two are combined together, a double crown that shows that the ruler rules both of those regions. The Upper Egyptian crown is usually white, Lower Egyptian crown is usually in red. Here you can see Amenhotep III with different crowns <clears throat> that showcase how the uh, Egyptian pharaoh is to be represented. The red crown and white crown can be combined, as you see here in the double crown. But most frequently in sculpture, you're going to run into this uh, headdress uh, effect. The nemes is the blue, usually blue and white, striped headcloth that the pharaoh wears. You will sometimes um, sometimes in carving and sometimes in painting, but often with this addition of the cobra or the uraeus. The unify, uh, unification of Upper and Lower Egypt is commemorated in this object. It's a really relatively remarkable uh, piece carved on the front and the back. So you're seeing both sides simultaneously here on the screen. This is known as the palette of King Narmer, a palette referencing uh, an object that would be used for mixing the eye makeup that the Egyptians wore. You'll notice that they wear what looks like a pretty heavy uh, black eyeliner around the eyes, and that is believed to function very much the way our uh, professional football players will use smudges of black makeup below their eyes to help cut down on the glare of the sun reflect back into their eyes on the playing field. The king you see is in triumph over his fallen enemy whom he is beating to death. You can all on soldiers below him. You can see the cities that he has conquered um, both on the front and the back. You can see the wall around the city. Here you see uh, <clears throat> King Narmer breaking through the wall in the, his guise of a militaristic-headed bull. 
also see that we have the composite view, the same proportions for all the figures, but the same composite view, profile head, full face torso, profile leg, eye for each of the human figures. But you'll notice that the proportions in terms of relative size of the head to the overall body is absolutely identical whether the person being depicted is the king, uh, one of his servants, or one of his enemies, you will notice for sure that even if the figures are on the same register and walking on the same uh, ground line, that people of lesser importance are smaller in scale, people of greater importance are larger, and of course that allows us to recognize the king as the largest, most important figure of all. That again is our hierarchical scale. We can certainly Hieroglyphs spelling out the name of King Marmor. You notice that the goddess Hathor is there, the cow with the woman's face. The figure of Horus sometimes appears as an eye, sometimes as this falcon. So he is uh, directly communicating the god's uh, belief that uh, Narmer should be victorious. He is going to unify the two halves of Egypt and form the first of the Egyptian Pharisees. He's going to be the first uh, land. So again, the palette of King Narmer is a piece you want to be able to recognize for the purposes of the test. When we look at the culture of ancient Egypt, one of the most important things to be aware of, of course, is the culture's obsession with death and the afterlife. So this is both part of the religion, but it's also very much part of decisions made about daily life and about architecture. So where the dead becomes really important. The Egyptians very much believed that your soul, um, which is somewhat external to your body, but is closely tied to it, it was referred to as the Ka, K-A. The Ka existed somewhat separately from you as a physical being, but it was a um, eternal. And the idea was that in death, the Ka would want to be able to return to the body, hence the mummification process and the need to preserve the body as much as possible, as well as the need for there to be statuary that the Ka could inhabit and that statuary needed also. So instead of a funeral system with grave markers and relatively small individual graves, a culture of begins to be seen in ancient Egypt. I mean, necropolis is literally a city of the dead, and so instead of building um, or digging in have tombs that function somewhat as chapels, but also ultimately as a housing place for your mummified corpse. You note that the mastaba, which is the architectural uh, form of the tomb at the earliest part of Egyptian history, sort of looks like a pyramid, except it point. It's more like one layer of a ziggurat, one platform. In fact, mastaba means bench. It looks kind of like a low seat space. As we move into the dynastic era, we can see the uh, funeral uh, structure for King Djoser. And King Djoser pyramid is really the step between the mastaba tradition and the uh, flowering of the pyramid building in the kingdom. So you can see here that this is essentially a series of mastaba one on top of the other, but it doesn't have that smooth, perfect that we associate with the uh, modern day, or rather the later um, Egyptian pyramids. So, pyramid of Dozier, and to know that we know the name of his chief architect, Imhotep, is also a very important fact for us. Process of mummification, one of the things that is most commonly done is that the internal organs would be removed and preserved. Hearts were often mummified and returned to the body. The brain was removed and discarded completely, but the liver, intestines, lungs would often be removed and then stored in these so-called canopic jars. And the heads on the canopic jars are related to the children of the god Osiris. So they each would sort of watch over you in the afterlife. One of the key things to be aware of with to this burial for the 
greatest leaders for the pharaohs and even their queens. You can see here queens pyramids associated with the uh, Great Pyramid of Khufu, is that it really is not a building that functions for any other purpose other than as a burial rest for a great personage such as the pharaoh. Um, the building itself doesn't really function as a uh, temple at stage. There are lots of smaller structures. There's lots of smaller uh, pyramids for burials of lesser uh, members there are also some burial sites for things like the boats that would carry the body of the dead to the burial site. So those would often be interred as well. But what you're seeing on this interior map is really kind of remarkable. The chamber that we as the burial site for the pharaoh is right here. It's a really large space relative to the size of the itself and it is made entirely out of enormous granite blocks and that space would probably be crushed by the overall if it weren't for these areas these are known as the relieving chambers they're empty spaces that have beams running across them that help to some of the weight and they're topped with what looks kind of like the top of a house right like the roof line there and this helps to shunt the weight of the mass off to the sides to prevent this space from collapsing. This area is known as the Grand Gallery. This is the Ascension Passage. So all the entrance is here. The priests and the body would come in this way, come up this space, inter the body here, and then leave. There are some false spaces, and I believe these were really there to help try to prevent um, <clears throat> grave robbers from stealing the goods that would King. The Egyptians, of course, believed that they were coming back, and so they needed to have things with them that would be useful to them in the next life. So they even include statues, small statues, of the servants that they would need, plenty of gold, food, uh, chariots, other things that they would use in there. You also will find the names of the pharaohs in these uh, decorative, sometimes horizontal, but vertical bands. They almost look like they've been wrapped or um, contained inside of a rope. These uh, contain the hieroglyphs that spell out uh, Pharaoh. These are known as the cartouches, and you can find a cartouche identifying Khufu's uh, name inside the pyramid. This was his space. Now, there are a bunch of different theories about how these enormous structures were built. Um, one of the first analyses of the Great Pyramids was <laughs> revealed the fact that if we took the pyramids apart, you'd be able to build around the entire nation of France that would be at least six feet in height, and it would encircle the entire country. That's an enormous amount of stone. Um, how did they manage to do this? We know that the Egyptians didn't have the wheel, for instance, and so they most likely were forced to using sleds, using wooden, uh, smooth, railed sleds. So the idea of stones up in the air becomes a really big problem. How do you get them once you've made the first couple layers? How do you keep going higher? So most scholars of theory of using a ramp. Now, depending on how uh, shallow the rise is on the ramp, possible for people to still be able to drag the stones up the ramps, you'd end up having to have a ramp that was incredibly long. The higher that this gets, the longer, otherwise the angle of ascent would be too high. So many scholars believe in an external ramp theory, where a ramp runs around the outside in a spiral form, and so the stones could be dragged up and then pulled off the top space. There is a relatively popular theory, and it has what proved and somewhat debunked in recent years is the possibility of a ramp that's actually internal to the structure that would then <clears throat> require a little bit less material than these ramps around the outside. It's interesting theory, but it has yet to be 100% proven. The 
this pyramid is pretty remarkable, 146 meters, about 230 meters in width on each side. The overall weight is somewhere in the neighborhood of 5 million tons. The average weight of those individual stones is about two and a half tons. So it's believed that you would team 200 people at once to be able to drag the stones into position. The pyramids are in a state of disrepair at this point because would have been faced with white limestone, and that would have been really brilliantly reflected in the sunlight in the desert. We also would have had decorative gold as well. In the interior, you can clearly see uh, along the ascension and into the Grand Gallery, this is the actual burial chamber of the king himself. This is Khufu's chamber. You can see, if you get really close to it, that the stones are really perfectly quarried there's very, very little uh, thin space of a gap in that particular space. So it's a really remarkable feat of engineering. These are the Queen's Pyramids to the side of Khufu's Great Pyramid. And this is Khufu's Solar Barge. This was one of the boat pits. And if you can believe it, what you're seeing to the right is the condition the boat was in when it was on Earth. It's been completely reconstructed and is now on site. Pharaoh's relatives are uh, definitely buried alongside in their smaller tombs, and so you can see their funeral um, carvings that depict uh, stories about their lives and depict their clothing and so forth. It's really important. Uh, the people of the royal family lived. You can see three major uh, pyramids in this overhead shot. This is followed by the Pyramid of Khafra and the, Pyra the Pyramid of Menkari. All of these have subsidiary buildings associated with the middle pyramid that also includes a funerary temple, this long causeway that also has the Sphinx associated with it and a temple to honor the Sphinx as well. So these pyramids themselves were built in that order. Khufu and of course, you know that your dates are somewhat confusing because we're looking at centuries before the common year zero. So Khufu's is the oldest, 2,551 years before the year zero. So that's roughly 3,000 and a half years ago. Um, when you look at the um, overall site, it's a little hard to determine from the photographs that you're looking at. In fact, the center, uh, the center pyramid looks bigger in this shot than it really is relative to the other two. We have leading up to our pyramids. We've also discovered some of the housing for the people who built the pyramids. They no longer believe they were built by slaves, but actually by free people who willingly worked on this project in between the uh, planting and harvesting seasons. Our middle pyramid, notice that the sculptures of the pharaohs really do conform to a particular type. You see the, you very rarely see any space carved between the arms and the torso or between the arms and the legs. Certainly there is solid stone between the legs and the throat. Again, the nemesis is the headdress, striped. The ka, of course, is your eternal soul. The uh, pharaoh would wear the nemes headdress adorned with this cobra known as the uraeus, and he has wooden decorative beard. One of the reasons that there is so little carved space in between the is because, of course, the desire was to make these statues be eternal, to make them last forever. If they were going to house the soul, the ka needed to have a place that wouldn't Return. So you can almost imagine taking a big block of stone and roughly carving it into a simple stair step shape and then repeating it to reveal the form of the pharaoh that you're trying to depict. That would allow the whole thing to remain very much locked into this block shape without sticking out that could easily be broken. Again, the primary material that's used for these statues tends to be diorite, which is quite dark. 
very hard, but the majority of the statues would have been painted. So we're accustomed to seeing them looking a single solid color and in the diorite, very dark. The Egyptians themselves, when they first uh, completed them, would have painted them to look very, very lifelike. There you can see Khafra's pyramid, the causeway, and the sphinx that's associated with him as well, which in fact has his face, a lion's body. Notice again that those proportions stay very much the same talking about sculpture in the round or whether we're talking about carved or painted depictions in essentially two dimensions. But notice that there's that solid space not been carved away to empty space to create more solidity in the form. If you actually try to do this, if you try to stand with your back straight against a that step forward, which makes the figure seem very much alive, your body won't actually allow you to keep your hips and shoulders against the wall and with your foot that far in front of you, it's physically impossible unless you step forward, your back and shoulders would move away from the wall bring over empty space. The Greeks are going to make their statues do this, which centers their weight over a negative space, which is why so many of the Greek statues the ankle and or the knee. The last of our uh, pyramid pharaohs is Menkari, and this is his queen, Kamer Nebdi. You will see that she clings to him very closely. She is very much um, the subordinate is taking a step forward, but not as definitively as her husband is. But relatively hard to tell him apart from either of the other two pharaohs. Pharaohs, in fact, conform to kind of an idealized type, and at first glance, they may look like very believable human bodies, certainly in comparison to something like the sculpture that we saw of the Sumerian votive figures. But again, if you really look closely, you can see that it's kind of a schematized or uh, system of depicting a body to follow certain specific proportional rules that aren't actually terribly realistic. The sharpness of that shin bone for instance, is a little bit off-putting. The way that the top cap of the shoulder muscle just kind of turns into the chest is a little unrealistic as well. So this to show individual separate specifics of um, exactly what these people looked like in life. I mean, after all, in this piece, you not only have the king and his wife, but you also have the goddess Hathor, and Hathor's uh, face is almost exactly identical to the queen's. Some pieces that definitely retain their painted aspect, and that brings up a really interesting point. Most of the male statues appear to be painted to a darker skin tone than the female statues. In fact, they're meant to be red-ish in their tone. It helps to distinguish between the um, but it does kind of raise the question of what the quote-unquote real skin tone of the people of Egypt would have been. You certainly can see the skin tone here in this seated scribe from Sakara. Now, the scribe is a statue that's meant to honor himself. He's not as part of a funeral for a pharaoh. This is from his own tomb. So we know that people outside the aristocracy but still highly placed in the class system would be able to have their own uh, funeral honor as well. And you can see that very clearly in the depiction of this figure. Now, one of the things that makes him is that his face is a little more individualistic and his body is a little more believable. That's certainly more acceptable to do for a body of a person who is not a pharaoh or a queen. You definitely want to remember this piece too. This is from the tomb of Tai. Tai is... Uh, he is not a pharaoh, but a highly placed man within Egyptian culture. And so he, this is him, and he's on a hippopotamus. His subordinates are at a physically smaller scale than he is. And if you look closely, you can see the hippopotami in the river. And then this really background that's all these vertical lines, that's actually meant to represent the vegetation on the side uh, of the riverbank. And if you look up those branches of trees, and you can see all kinds of animals and birds depicted there as well. The closer you get to the carving, you can see 
figures of the human beings are rendered in very, very um, rigid and systematic kind of ways. They all mode of one another. They're just kind of the identical body one after the other. But as we've seen in other cultures, we saw this a bit with the Assyrians as well. The images is where the artist has a little more freedom to be expressive and to show some idiosyncratic individuality and personality and emotion as well.